So what is old age? Well, if you listen to the government, they tell us that, uh, what is it for Medicare? Yeah, about 65 years of age. Uh, if you listen to the American with Disabilities Act, well, I think that's about 55, right? Um, and there's that personal one. Maybe you've heard it. You're only as old as you feel. Yeah, uh, I think I kind of like that one. I heard uh, or the scientific community has some challenge talking about older folks. And maybe you've seen, you've met some of these folks. Um, I remember taking a, an afternoon walk uh, there in uh, Oklahoma. We walked up to some springs, and on the way back, we had a, a friend of ours with us who is, how old is Harold, 75? 76? <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> mid-70s, and we've walked to the springs, and we come back. And as we come back to the, kind of the visitor's house, there's and this is Oklahoma, there is the picture of an old cowboy. As a matter of fact, could have been the Marlboro man, right? He had his hat on and his boots, and he's sitting there. And uh, <clears throat> Harold was old enough to be able to walk up to this fellow and say, howdy, how are you? And they struck up a little conversation, finally got around to saying, well, how old are you? What was he? 62, I think. <clears throat> and he looked like he was pushing 90, whereas Harold, who was 70, Look, you know, he's and acting like a 62 years old, year old. So you can't always tell by looking. And, and so the, the scientific community has tried to divide the, this older age group up into three categories. Here they are. The scientific literature divides old folks into early elderly, middle elderly, <laughs> and late elderly. Now, I heard some marketers talking about this. Uh, several months ago, and they divided it a little differently. They said, it's go-go, uh, slow-go, and no-go. <laughs> and maybe that fits as well. So I guess what old age is is still up, up for grabs. We don't have necessarily the answer. If we look at the population studies, it's, uh, and, and what the population looks like, it, it's kind of interesting. This is from the Census Bureau, and it was put together in about 1990, looking forward to see what would happen with the population. And, and you can see them here. There's the, uh, <coughs> the slow-go, the, no, the no-go, the <laughs> slow-go, and the go-go, okay? All three of them lined up there <coughs> in 1990, and you can see in millions of people on the left-hand side. 2010, the expectations look like this. And then in 2030, it looks like this. And we see in the population kind of an increase, if you will, in the number of uh, folks that are reaching that old age in really all three categories. Yes, <clears throat> that's me, the baby boomers in that last group, okay? And I'm, I'm coming along here uh, slowly, feeling more like it today than yesterday. Here's another way that the population is looked at. And I really like this one. It's, it's kind of fun. <clears throat> this is, uh, if you'll see, 1995. We have 0 to 5 years of age, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15, all the way up to 90 plus. And, and then this gives you uh, males on this side, females on this side, and then the whole population. So you begin to see the shape of the, of the population. And there's this kind of bulge here in the middle. You can see the baby boomers kind of coming through and what the expectations are uh, for the population through 2010 and then 2030. So there's more and more folks getting older. <clears throat> That's not news yet, is it? <laughs> You're probably aware of that. Studying and finding out about the aging process is a real challenge. Uh, let's take, for example, a young fellow who decides to commit his life to studying the aging process. He decides in high school. So by, he's through college, and maybe he's a real bright boy, and so maybe, what, what time do they get through with college? Is it about 20, 21, somewhere along in there? And gets right into his Ph.D. program. Runs through, now the Ph.D. program is pretty tough, right? So he's a bright boy, so he gets done by 25. Now, before he can get that big grant, 
to study, to do the big study in aging, he's got to get a little bit of a reputation. And he's, he publishes a lot, and by age 30, he's ready to start this uh, grand and wonderful study to find out about how humans get older. He's got a major problem because he needs to start this study at conception, right? <laughs> By the time his subjects get old, he's going to be dead. That's our problem as we try to study human aging. Uh, so we have to look in other way, for other ways to do it. And so we've done several, uh, tried to look at this different ways. And maybe you've heard of the Vilcombambiums, the Hyundai, the Hunzas and the Georgians, the Caucasus Mountains, I guess, the Vilcom Bambians from the Andes, the Hunza from the Himalayas. These people are, they live a long time. So one of the ways to find out what it is that helps people long, live a long time is to go talk to those folks, study them, check their blood tests, find out what they do. What is the secret of their longevity? And so we've done that. We notice it in all three places. They live in the mountains. There's a lot of physical activity. They're walking uphill. They're walking. They're all over the place walking. Uh, and so an increase in physical activity. A group of Hunzas were looked at, 25 of them. Their average cholesterol, 150 to 180. That's pretty good, isn't it? So something about their lifestyle is leaving their cholesterol low. That's a clue. And then it says that low energy and fat intake. Now, that doesn't mean they have low energy. They're sitting around doing nothing. That means they're not taking a lot of calories in. When the scientist talks about energy intake, he's talking about how many calories going. So energy intake is low, and fat intake is low. So there's some clues. Now, this is observational, and I don't know that we can uh, uh, rely on it heavily, but it gives us some clues. Uh, another way to do this is to look at people, for example, in our own country who live a long time. And we've looked at centenarians. Here's a, a study done on some uh, 30 centenarians from Kentucky. And you're going to look at them and say, you know, what is it about them that seems to, to maybe explain why they live such a long time? Well, 18 never had alcohol and 12 never had excessive alcohol use. And I suppose that makes sense. 50% of them had hypertension, so I, I guess there's a little bit of uh, hypertension, but often more people have hypertension than that, so it's a little less maybe in these older uh, folks. Heart disease is about 33%, and they were 50% uh, of them were moderately active, with only uh, two of them dependent on others for their care. So uh, <clears throat> that's what we learned from this group of uh, centenarians, those who have lived 100 years of age in, in Kentucky. It, what's interesting, as we look at this older population, we discover that the cause of death is different in the older pop, this very old population than it is in the younger, older folks. What's the most common cause of death uh, in the, oh, let's say, the average older male? Heart disease. And cancer is close by, is it not? Well, it ends up that... Uh, more common in the centenarians is infection, and then comes cancer, and then comes heart disease. Apparently, the people that live to 100 uh, don't have heart disease, and that's why they live longer. As we get older, our immune systems tend to weaken, and it's not uncommon for someone to come down with a urine infection, gets into the bladder, I'm sorry, into the bladder, into the kidneys, and then into the blood. People 95, 100, 105 will often get very sick, actually, bacteria in their blood before that you even see a fever. So uh, it's, it's the infections that tend to get folks. Or a pneumonia, an aspiration pneumonia. It's not a bad way to go. Catch the infection. Uh, the infection gets into the blood. Antibiotics, doctors can't stop it. And three to five, maybe seven days, it, it's over quickly rather than dragging out like it does for things like emphysema. Cancer, of course, is a... Is a challenging disease, but it has something to do with the immune system getting weak as well. And then coronary artery disease seems to be a little further down. Uh, there's a relative absence of type 2 diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. Apparently, these are people that miss the lifestyle diseases, by and large. So that's uh, 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 some clues that we have from looking at, at uh, people who are on the very old end of things. Well, <clears throat> Let's see, another fascinating study was done to look at this 
done in a prospective sort of a way, is the Alameda Health Study. Now, Alameda County is one of the wealthiest counties in the United States, happens to be in the North San Francisco Bay Area. And someone came up with a grand idea, let's get all the old folks and ask them all the questions we can think of, of things that might make lo life longer or shorter, and then we'll watch them. So they watched them, 7,000 people who were 70 years of age or older. They watched them from 1965 to 1974. Have access to the death records so we know what the cause of death was. And then w each of them was asked all these questions. Then at the end of 10 years, you go back and say, okay, who died from what? And which question answers predicted the death from whatever the problem was? Great idea, a way of looking at, at uh, uh, the aging process. What did they learn? Well, <clears throat> number one, if you don't smoke, you're going to live longer. That's kind of uh, obvious, isn't it? You, you weren't surprised at that. Number two, regular exercise helps people live longer. Well, now that's a clue we kind of picked up from those folks who live a long time. They tend to be a little more active. So regular exercise helps people live longer. Having an appropriate weight. Well, that's understandable too, isn't it? Being overweight tends to increase the risk of heart disease and diabetes and hypertension, strokes, etc. So having an appropriate weight makes a, is a good predictor. Now, this one may be a little bit of a surprise to you. A regular breakfast was also predictive of living longer. Are you surprised about that? This particular study has no way of telling us the why. It's just looking for associations. I don't have the answer, but I have some ideas. Yes, sir? That's what the scientists told us. <laughs> I do not know the study well enough to tell you exactly what the answer to that is. Well, I expect it runs till about 10, but I don't know because <laughs> I haven't looked at the study. I, I, you're trying to interpret this, I'm sure. As I, as I try to understand why, I, I'd like to know why, and I can come up with some ideas. Can you come up with any ideas as why a regular breakfast might help people live longer? You have energy for the day. Okay, that might be good. Blood sugar to your brain, that tends to help us think a little better. Could it be that the foods that are often chosen for breakfast have some protective uh, uh, benefits? You know, fruit, for example. Another thing I thought of, maybe, and I, I really think eating a big meal at night is detrimental. If you eat a big meal and lay down, people who eat a big meal uh, at night and lay down aren't hungry in the morning, so they don't eat breakfast. So maybe this is kind of a secondary from that standpoint. I don't know. Uh, there's a, a lot of possibilities here. Uh, we just know that there's an association. <clears throat> no snacks are also associated with living longer. Yes, ma'am. Well, the, yeah, it, it helps the body to rest if you don't eat a big meal before you go to bed at night. That makes a lot of sense, and that may be another one of those things. Can you believe it here? No snacks tends to help people live longer as per the Alameda Health Study. And I suppose that makes sense too if we stop to think about it. You've heard it, haven't you? The bigger the snacks, the bigger the slacks. <laughs> so that tends to make us gain weight and it's hard to get healthy snacks. Often they're sugar and fat or salt and fat and they're advertised, I'll bet you can't eat one. So that may have something to do with it as well. Now, here is uh, uh, another one, seven to eight hours of sleep a day. Now, for those of you who are here to, to hear the lecture, please understand that per day means per 24 hours, and we're talking about night, not during the lecture, okay? <laughs> so uh, seven to eight hours of sleep were predictive of, of, of living longer. Interesting study, which gives us some insight. It doesn't give us whys, it just tells us what. So if you're looking for some behaviors to adopt to help improve your longevity, this is a good list, I think. Well, we still have challenges in trying to understand how to live a long time. And so we uh, uh, continue our journey trying to find answers. 
If we look around the world at different countries and how long they live, uh, we find, and this is a selected chart, here's the rank, those that live the longest, Okinawa, number two, Japan, number three, Hong Kong, number four, Sweden, number eight, Italy, they're not all here, obviously, we have chosen, then Greece and the United States. Fascinating bunch of uh, numbers here. Life expectancy is listed here in years to give us a sense from the United States up to Okinawa at the time of these, this was actually published by the World Health Organization in 1996, so it's not brand new information. And, and there's been advanced, uh, there's more data now. So you can see the difference here. Here's kind of the eating pattern with uh, the American, standard American diet, and then an east-west sort of a pattern in Okinawa. There's Asian, Nordic, and Mediterranean, which is why these countries were chosen. If we look at this, this is coronary heart disease, that is, heart attacks and that type of stuff. Uh, this is adjust aged, adjusted death rates per 100,000 people. In Okinawa, it's 18 per 100,000. In the United States, it's 100 per 100,000. So you see a bit of a spectrum here with uh, looks like the Nordic diet being, or the Nordic lifestyle being a little bit uh, closer to ours here in the United States. Cancer, 97 in Okinawa versus 132 per 100,000. And then stroke, uh, it looks like we're doing better here in stroke, probably because we treat hypertension aggressively. Uh, the Okinawans are not doing quite so well, and there's all-cause mortality at the far side. So what is it about these Okinawans that help them live a long time? There's been, there is a large study set up that is uh, supposed to go from generation to generation looking at the Okinawans, trying to solve that problem by getting a group of scientists over time involved on this one. Oh, there's the, oh, there's the Okinawa pointed out. Here we go. Okinawa longevity. Now we look at it over time. Here's Okinawa. They were actually behind Sweden back in 1960, and they have uh, headed up to the top. The uh, Japanese were not doing very well back here, but have done really quite well, at least up to the 2000 uh, year mark. You can see the United States is kind of uh, falling back behind here, getting a little further behind. As you look at this... Uh, information, uh, this statistic uh, through time. So what is it about the Okinawan experience? It's, it's rather fascinating what happens. Okinawans eat 40% fewer calories than we do in this country. So uh, that's uh, significant less energy. 17% uh, fewer calories than the Japanese average. Maybe this caloric restriction has something to do with their longevity. The caloric intake of Okinawan children is 36% below the Japanese recommended intake. But recognize that what the Okinawans eat is a uh, very healthy diet. I visited Okinawa in 1961 uh, as a child, and I remember this road going from town to the military base at the other end. And on either side of the road, all the way really to the ocean, where you could see uh, truck farms, just small little garden plots. They eat out of the garden, a lot of green, a lot of, and beautiful gardens too. So their, their food is very high in nutrients. It's not junk food, it's not highly refined. They get it from the uh, ground. And Okinawans have adequate nutrition. That is, the nutrients are there, it's just calorically restricted. Well, the illness is, uh, is quite uh, significant, uh, decreased, it's low. Down here on the right-hand corner, you can see 97-year-old karate master, Saikiki Yuhaha. <laughs> I guess that's how I'm supposed to say his name. Yuhara, okay. A lot of very elderly uh, uh, and very active elderly older folks. Some of you have seen the uh, Blue Zone, the little thing on National Geographic that looked at some of the older folks in Okinawa and some other populations. Fascinating, uh, these folks. 75% more likely to keep their cognitive ability than Americans. 80% fewer breast and prostate cancers. 
50% fewer ovarian and colon cancers. There's something about what those Okinawans are doing that looks good. 50% fewer hip fractures. Now, how do you prevent hip fractures? Does anybody know? Well, sure, you need lots of calcium, haven't you heard? What's the recommended calcium intake for Americans? 12 to 1,500 milligrams per day for a uh, average uh, postmenopausal woman. The average calcium intake for the Okinawans is 500 milligrams. I mean, they're eating plants. They're not eating so much of the animal protein, which tends to suck the calcium out. That was a previous lecture. So <clears throat> they tend to do very well with their diet. Here's some other, oh, 80% fewer heart attacks as well. So that, that's good. Here's, Here's uh, some science that co is coming out of that study. This is looking at serum lipid peroxidases. These are, are peroxides. These are things that damage the LDL, so increase your risk of heart attack. And you, you can see here that those that are 100 years of age, looking, looking at the older Okinawans, the older ones, these bad things in their blood are quite a bit lower than those who are actually 70 years of age in Okinawa. It's something to do with the way the older folks are still eating and exercising that's making a difference. You have total on the far right, and female in the middle, and male on the left. So there's some protection from this kind of oxidizing, aging compound that, uh, that these Okinawans have. Here's uh, uh, another interesting look at some yearly cancer dates. Okinawa is in the blue. You can see breast, ovarian, prostate, and colon. And you can see uh, several countries listed across in different colors. Look how low the Okinawans are pretty much across the board. Can't, they're protected against that cancer. Now, as we've looked at this, uh, at this uh, population and tried to understand, yes, sir? meat, dairy, maybe even vitamin D deficiency. I mean, it could be a variety of different things. It's hard to know from these studies. These studies are just looking at populations. We have to dig deeper to find cause and effect relationships. But yes, all of those are possibilities. This is uh, fascinating. They've done some genetic work. And when they compare the older and the younger uh, Okinawans, you know, their genes should be pretty close to the same. What they're finding is that 30% of living longer is genetic and 70% is lifestyle. Yes? That's been done with the Japanese, but it hasn't been done, to my knowledge, with the Okinawans. Now, Okinawans are Japanese. Okinawan Island is kind of like the Hawaii of Japan. It's, it's further south and a little bit warmer. And it, it, but the Japanese people populate it. So when they looked at it, it looks like 30% is explainable by genetics and 70% by lifestyle. Yes, you can have a gene that helps you live longer, but if you choose a lifestyle, as well as, as good genes, then you can live longest. If you don't have the genes, well, you can still do the best you can with what you got, right? So we're not going to give up on that. Uh, some fascinating uh, work has been uh, done on uh, the genes. And, of course, this one is a big concern, is uh, dementia. And we want to talk about that in one of our talks later on a little more. But look at it here. You can see... Uh, U.S. is in the green, and dementia is pretty high. Japan is catching up. But the Okinawans are still staying quite low, uh, prevalence of about 15% in the different age groups. There's 65 to 69 here. When you get up to 85 to 90, uh, the Okinawans are doing much better on the uh, uh, Alzheimer's or dementia problem. Yes. Again, that's a, a thought. Stress would be an idea of what might uh, make the aging happen quicker. But we can't tell that from this type of study. We can simply say this population is doing better. Then we have to dig in other ways. Some of the studies that I've showed you have looked at, for example, the oxidative stress. And, and yes, oxidative stress can be made worse by physical or emotional stress. So yes, it may be connected there. But to know for sure, 
uh, we, we don't at this point. So <clears throat> what is it? We've learned about from the Okinawans. We've learned from the, what, the uh, Alameda st uh, Health Study. We've looked at the folks who live a long time in various parts of the, of the world. What is it that really uh, helps us live a long time? And what it comes down to is something called caloric restriction. The studies have been done in the rats and the mice because we can outlive them, okay? They live a few weeks, we can study them again. We've looked at protein, we've looked at carbohydrates, we've looked at fat and all kinds of combination. We've looked at nutrients, we've looked at all kinds of things. And the things that make rats live longest is called caloric restriction. What is caloric restriction? Well, it means um, in the lab, in the rat lab, when you've got these rats living in cages, you can imagine them. Have you ever imagined yourself a rat in a cage with a wheel that you could run on and a little place where you could get food to eat? What would you do? Eat food, not run on the cage, right? And if you were bored to tears, because the rats have to kind of live by themselves, then what would you do? You'd eat. And so that's called in the, uh, in the scientific community ad libitum. I think it's Latin for all you want, right? So the rats eat all they want. And to restrict those calories helps them live longer. Best way to do that is to give a rat adequate nutrition as they, till they get through their, quote, teen years, adolescence, and then restrict their calories and they'll live a long time. Now, does that uh, sound cruel? Ad libitum versus restriction, uh, all you want versus some sort of a limit, plenty versus need, and we might even say cage versus natural, because how do the mice and rats do it, right? They run here, they run there, they find a little seed. This is how it works, it's supposed to work in the natural world, unless they happen to find your larder, right? <laughs> and then they can make, may eat a lot. But in the, in the quote, natural world, out in the wild, they have to run from place to place, and they're naturally calorically restricted. It's really unnatural to be in a cage and eat all you want uh, and not exercise very much. So I don't look at it as cruel. I look at it as beneficial. Now, here is a graph showing what happens when you take mice and you look at their survival. Here is no caloric restriction. CR stands for caloric restriction. So non-caloric restricted, these mice tend to live out this long. If you restricted their calories 25%, didn't feed them quite as much, they would live longer. It restricted 55%, uh, nearly out to uh, 50 months. And 65, you get just a little bit further. Now there's a point of, of, uh, of what, reducing returns because there's not enough nutrition and if you get closer and closer to zero, of course, rats will start to to uh, die sooner, but it looks like somewhere around 50% caloric restriction off of eating all you want helps the mice live the longest. Interesting, huh? Uh, <clears throat> here, the next one kind of shows us the uh, same data a little differently. There's 100% calories down on the right, and here's kind of the longevity, how long they're going to live. You can see as the calories reduce, they tend to live longer. And that's that graph. So the early studies on uh, aging, learning about the physiology of aging and how to live a long time have been done on rodents. All of those studies on rodents have been repeated in the primates. Primates are monkeys, apes, are felt to have physiology very close to ours. And so we're, we think we're getting closer to understanding about how to live long from a... Uh, human, uh, in, a, in a human body. Well, how does it come down and how does it work? Science is beginning to help us understand us, this. This is a complicated slide. Let me kind of help you understand it. This I pulled from a scientific review of the aging process. Oh, let's see. It was written in 2001, so it's not brand new. We've understood this uh, for some time. Have you ever heard of a free radical? Teenager in the 60s, right? 
A free radical, as we think of it in biochemistry, not in our memories of our past, is an extra electron that gets released. And maybe you've uh, even heard about how free radicals can accelerate the aging process. And maybe you've taken things like vitamin A or vitamin E to help protect against the oxidants. You take the antioxidants to help protect against the free radicals. Well, our body in the normal physiology makes a lot of free radicals. Each cell in the body makes between 10 to the 5th and 10 to the 6th free radicals every day. Add that together, it's a horrendous number. It's part of taking your food and turning it into something, that the energy that the body needs, ATP, if you will. That, most of that takes place in the mitochondria. So here, here are the mitochondria is listed here. Mitochondria and some others as well uh, make these reactive oxygen species, free radicals, if you will. Now, the body has an antioxidant system to help protect, but anything that gets through, there's a backup system. And so we see this backup system here to repair DNA that's been damaged by a free radical, to repair the proteins or several different... Uh, repair mechanisms that are meant to back up the system if a free radical is not gathered up by the free radical scavenger or antioxidant. And if this system fails, then what happens is cell death. So what we think is the damage builds up over time and cells begin to die one at a time. We see it in our muscles, for example. The muscle cells will slowly die. Heart, the skeletal muscle, and the heart is, is more likely to be weak. The muscles are more likely to be weak. Our capacity tends to decrease as we get older as there are cells which die and are not uh, replaced. We think this is related to the free radicals that are made. Now, I told you between 10 to the 5th to 10 to the 6th free radicals a day. That's a tenfold difference, isn't it? What really makes the difference is how can we decrease the number of free radicals, right? How can we minimize that? It ends up that the system gets much more efficient. It makes many fewer free radicals if we are calorically restricted. If we have extra calories, we tend to make extra free radicals. And that's a, a, a very important kind of basic principle here. And up to, if you go from an overfed state to a low-fed state, you can decrease the free radicals by, you know, divide by 10. It's an incredible reduction. If you happen to overeat, you know, you start out uh, on the starvation side, and you overeat, why well, you can actually increase the number of free radicals by 10 times. So 100,000 to a million? Free radicals, it's your choice, and what really tends to make a difference is caloric restriction. You can't really cover it by taking vitamin E or vitamin C or coenzyme Q10 or whatever it is. There's not enough of those things in your body to really protect you. What you need to do is decrease the number going in. And so to live a long time, what we need to do is to live on the calorically restricted side. Now, what I just shared was a rather complicated concept. If somebody asked a question, I'd have an idea that maybe you understood it, or you'd explain to me where you didn't understand it. Anybody have a question at all? High antioxidants. Uh -huh. Oh, that, that's good because you get those, uh, all those uh, antioxidants into your system. That's part of how the body kind of removes the, the free radicals. But the best way to do it is to decrease the number of free radicals that you make. And you have to, to do that, you decrease the caloric intake. You need to be on the low side. Yes. Very good question. The, what the body burns is, in, and if those of you who remember
remember a little biochemistry. It's in the Krebs cycle. You, you make a lot there. And the sugar comes in there, and fat comes in there, and protein comes in from a couple different places. So that's where most of the energy happens. It's in the mitochondria, and it can happen with fat or carbohydrates. But <clears throat> this reminds me of an example. Have you ever, on a hot summer afternoon, saw the neighbor kids uh, selling lemonade? And you pay your, was it a 25 cents? I think the last ones wanted five bucks, you know. <laughs> and you drink that big glass of lemonade, an hour later, you're hotter than you were before. Because all that sugar came in and your body tries to turn it into heat. It tries to waste it. It doesn't want to put, put it on as stored energy, as fluff or fat. It wants to burn it. And so it increases the heat. And that is that, those, all those extra calories. That's that extra free radical. And it, the body is, that's what's happening. Okay? Good, yes. Good. Those, oh, somebody says, the apple is better than the apple pie. We've talked about this before here, haven't we? It's better to eat the apple than the apple juice. You get the fiber, you have the nutrients without so many calories. We're discovering just how important fiber is. Fiber, this is fascinating. When your mitochondria burn the food, it uh, gives its free radicals to the mitochondrial wall. Vitamin E sits in there, and have you all heard of coenzyme Q10? Yeah, it sits in there, and it grabs all those free radicals, and it passes it into the cell. And in the cell, there's something called vitamin C. It's a water-soluble sort of a thing. And that vitamin C will take the electrons, those, those free radicals, to the cell wall. And then the cell has something that hangs out called a bioflavonoid. Have you heard that? It comes in, you know, that white part around the orange and other parts. It comes in, in, in our, our food, or especially our fruit. So it hangs the free radicals out and then something called glutathione comes along and picks it up from there and takes the free radical to the gut where it gives it to the fiber in the intestines. So the fiber in the intestines is actually the sink for the free radicals made in our body. And the whole system needs to work in balance. If you give a whole bunch of vitamin C, it'll suck up all the free radicals and have no way to put them. And it'll cause problems. It turns an antioxidant into an oxidant. So you need a balance of, the, of things, and that's what you get when you eat whole food. Yeah. That's right. The closer we get it to the way God made it, the better off we are. Let's take a look at a couple of these systems. There's the mitochondria, which I pointed out. Uh, a very important place. Probably most of the free radicals are made there. Iron and other metal ions tend to make this worse. People who eat a diet that's high in red meat, for example, especially as we get older, once the women stop menstruating, they have no real further need for lots and lots of iron. It tends to go into storage. We store it better as we get older. Too much iron tends to accelerate this whole process of aging. So we'd rather not have that. Let's see, another one we could show here is the glutathione system. This is an antioxidant that you may or may not have heard of, uh, made out of three amino acids. Our body makes it itself, kind of like the vitamin C of our body, but our, our body makes it. So uh, that is another fascinating uh, system made out of cysteine, glutamate, and glycine. And then I think the last one is this uh, superoxide dismutase, which tends to grab the extra free radical oxygen and knock it out. Uh, it's fascinating how God has built this system in. So the aging process is accelerated by lots of free radicals. Please, don't worry about the ones from 1960. Don't worry about the ones from your environment. You may have heard that if you have uh, well, ozone in the environment, it causes free radicals and can cause, or maybe cooking your food might cause some free radicals in the food. But please, those are just so small by comparison of the millions. I mean, each cell in our body is putting out hundreds of thousands of these every day. That's really where the action is. It's not that stuff in the environment. I wouldn't worry about that so much. So... <clears throat> We need caloric restriction to live a long time.
We talked earlier, I think, didn't we say something about diabetes? Diabetes and aging. Diabetes has been described as accelerated aging. Everything with aging just happens faster in diabetes, whether it's the nerves or the eyes or the brain or whatever it is, tends to get faster. And diabetes is caused by, those of you who have heard me talk about this before, too many calories in and not enough calories out. That is a caloric excess. That makes more free radicals. That accelerates the whole aging process. So this is a direct uh, quote from the scientific literature, and indeed I've heard it in uh, uh, medical meetings as well. Now, this is kind of interesting. This is from the Israeli Ischemic Heart Disease Study. A bunch of people who were evaluated 1960s to 1999, 40 to 65 years of age at the beginning, and uh, those that had diabetes at the beginning were 2.83 times more likely to end up with dementia. And that shouldn't be a surprise to us. Excess calories tend to cause excess problems in the body with the aging process, and that includes the dementia piece. So uh, it's, uh, we don't know the causes exactly. This is another one of those descriptive studies that shows some uh, comparison. So Benjamin Franklin put it like this. <clears throat> to lengthen thy life, lessen thy meals. Is it ever too late to make a change? Not as long as you're above the ground. When you're pushing daisies, it may be too late, but if as long as you're alive, you can make a change. Now, I've looked for scientific evidence of this, and I, I just, I, I really, I, I laughed out loud when I found the one and only article I've seen where the scientific community has addressed, when is it too late to start making changes in your lifestyle? The study was done on, oh, you're not going to believe this, fruit flies. <laughs> and, you know, fruit flies don't live very long, but seven days maybe, right? And that's their lifespan. So how do you make a fruit fly live longer? You restrict its calories. And so they applied caloric restriction at day one, and the fruit flies live longer. They applied uh, the caloric restriction on day two and the fruit flies live longer. Day three, day four, day five, all the way to day seven. And no matter how late they started the caloric restriction, the fruit flies still lived the, the, the same length of time. Now, I don't know whether that's applicable to you and me. <laughs> I eat enough fruit that sometimes I feel like a fruit fly, <laughs> so maybe it will work. I don't think it's ever too late. When I think about being too late, I think about uh, my wife's grandmother. Now, my wife's grandmother is uh, a very important person in uh, my life. Uh, <clears throat> our life, I guess, is, is fair to say. When uh, Dina and I got to know each other, I actually won her grandmother's heart before I won Dina's heart, you see. <laughs> so grandma was kind of important. <clears throat> grandma, when I met her, was 93 years of age. When Grandma was 80, 80, Grandpa died. Uh, they thought it was a colon cancer. Ended up it wasn't, but Grandpa died. Grandma had grown up at a time when uh, science had just discovered calories. <laughs> and you know, in order to be healthy, you have to have calories. So what did she eat to be healthy? Cookies, candy, cake. And, and in those days, maybe you remember, uh, fluffy was healthy and skinny was sick. Well, Grandma, at age 80, when Grandpa died, was sick. She had angina, heart problems. She had elevated blood sugars, diabetes. She was very fluffy, some high blood pressure. And when Grandpa died, the woman who is now my mother-in-law said, Mom, come live with me. Now, my mother-in-law had made some lifestyle changes herself. She'd lost 60 pounds and was living her a healthier lifestyle. Her health problems had gotten better. She says, I'm going to help Grandma. So Grandma came to stay with my, uh, those who became my in-laws. 
And my mother-in-law describes how she put grandma on this new lifestyle. She uh, cut down her evening meal so she would, uh, or even eliminated it. She gave her fruits and vegetables and cut out the cakes and the pastries and the candy. And then she had her exercise. And she describes watching grandma go down the stairs in front of the house, down to the end of the sidewalk, turn, take a few steps, stop, kind of grab her heart, reach into her pocket, pull out her nitroglycerin, and put one under her tongue. <laughs> and she, just, she tells me, what am I doing, killing my mother? <laughs> but she kept at it. Grandma was a little bit worried, you know, losing weight. That wasn't healthy. By the time I met Grandma, she was no longer fluffy. She had no angina. She had no hypertension. And she's one of those 90-year-olds years old, 90 year olds that didn't have any medication. She was very, very active. As a matter of fact, she joined uh, the, the folks that are now my in-laws. They were missionaries in the Philippines. And she was out in the barrios helping. She was very active. Her life was given back to her at age 80. Grandma died at 103. Pneumonia. Not the diabetes, heart disease, and all that stuff. It, the infection, you know, the immune system tends to get a little weaker, and then she died relatively quickly. It was good quality of life. Well, Grandma came through the Depression, and she was always worried about uh, money. She did get her cataracts fixed, but she refused to pay the money for hearing aids because it cost too much. I remember once we went home, Grandma was reading constantly, and she couldn't hear much going around. It was for Christmas, and we had some wrapping paper, and once we were finished with the wrapping paper, uh, you know, had these tubes that the wrapping paper was on. Dina discovered you could put up to her ear, and Grandma came alive. She could hear. <laughs> but her mind was with her. It was, it was clear. She was... A, a productive member of society. She began to slow down towards the end. But she did something that I like to call, the scientific community calls, squaring out the curve. Have you heard this before? It's kind of our goal. Really, when we talk about aging gracefully, we don't care about living so long. We want to live good, right? If you take, uh, and I've kind of drawn this little chart as an illustration, uh, there on the left, you can see high quality life. That's 100% high quality life. And uh, you can see down below time. And so sometimes the average American will make lifestyle choices that aren't that healthy. Maybe they're smoker and eating junk food. They come down with COPD, severe angina, and they have what I've called the dwindles. You know, kind of sitting in the nursing home waiting for years to, to kind of die hardly functional. It's not my idea of a good time. It's not what I want to do. What I'd like to do is something closer to uh, what Grandma did. Even if my life is a little shorter, I would like to square out the curve. I want to have a high-quality life and then go to sleep and not wake up, right? Does that make sense? That's, that's kind of the goal as we talk about aging gracefully. We would like to have a high quality life. I uh, told you about my grandpa, you know, the one that married the young chick who was 83 years of age. Grandpa did pretty good. <clears throat> that big home, five bedrooms, uh, into which he brought his new bride, uh, got a little too big for him. Uh, she ended up uh, getting sicker than he and had to go to a nursing home. So Grandpa was alone in this big house, and he said, ah, I'm tired of it. He had been living out of his garden uh, in the back, and he was a, a fantastic gardener, tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, potatoes. I mean, the whole thing, he really did a good job. Grandpa said, I'm getting tired of cooking for myself. I'm going to find a some place where I can get taken care of, have somebody cook for me. So he found a place in Oregon, some people there that he knew, and he sold his house, and he, he rented two rooms in this retirement center. They had a door between them. Uh, one served of his bedroom. In front of the door was that train set. Remember the train set I told you about? He still had it at uh, 90, 91, 92 years of age. And uh, 
Grandpa did well. He began to slow down. He used to joke. He says, I've ordered a cane. They're going to send it to me when I'm 100. Well, it ended up that about 92, 91, 92, he needed it. And so he got a cane. And, and then he slowed down a little more. He says, he, I didn't want to slow down. So he got one of those little red electric carts. And he would go everywhere. As a matter of fact, he and some other fellows in the retirement center kind of got a club together. They all got their little red carts, and they would head out out into the country, and then uh, Grandpa did well. He got up one morning from his bed, walked to the sink to wash up, and dropped. That was it. I'd really like to do it Grandpa's way. Right? Live well, eat well, and then square that curve out. Make sense? So that's the high quality life that we're looking for, uh, not simply longevity. Any questions or comments before we wrap it up? Yes? It ends up that we can't look at protein, fat, or nutrients. What makes the biggest difference in the aging process from our science is the calories restriction. It doesn't matter what kind of calories they are, as long as you're calorically restricted. Because, as we understand it, it decreases the number of free radicals by up to 10 times. I suppose uh, you could get yourself to that point. If you want an interesting journey, get on the computer and uh, uh, Google or do a search on something like caloric restriction. There are clubs of people out there who are aware of this research who are actually doing this uh, as a way to live a long time. One way to do that, and I think the healthiest way to do it, is to eat a whole foods diet. When you eat plants as grown, your, your nutrients are high and your calories are low. Another good reason, from my standpoint, to skip or minimize that evening meal, to reach the fasting state. The fasting state is where energy is coming from storage. When energy is coming from storage, then things are the most efficient. You're actually pushing your whole physiology into that efficient zone when you reach the fasting state. It takes 8 to 12 hours to reach the fasting state. So if you eat supper, you may not actually reach that by breakfast time. Better to reach it in the middle of the night. And so you may have heard me say something like, breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, and supper like a pauper. Yes? Her question is, <clears throat> if people are lean, does that mean they're restricted in their caloric intake habits? That may or may not be the case. <clears throat> there are some people who are, can be very skinny, that is, look thin, if you will, and have caloric excess. And it's the free radicals that make the difference, not how much fat you carry. It's how many free radicals you make. So even though you're thin, if you overeat, you may still be. If you're eating more than, you know, than then restricted, you increase the free radicals. As a matter of fact, it may be that those people that are thin by nature tend to burn stuff more and may actually make more free radicals. We don't, the, you can't tell by the thinness. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. It's not a bad choice. If I weren't working, I, that's, I think when retirement comes, I'll be eating about 8 to 8.30 in the morning and then about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. To me, that would be an ideal uh, balance because I'm not hungry then in the evening. My body can reach that caloric. Yes, I think that's a very reasonable thing to do. Yes, ma'am. if you make that adjustment, if you can space the meals. Thank you. Yes. Sure. People that are overweight have at some time eaten too many calories. But you can still be overweight and healthy 
if your weight is on its way down. And the direction of the weight is much more important than the actual weight. So if you're losing weight, you've entered that caloric restricted zone, haven't you? Because that's what weight is. You're burning more calories than you're taking in. So that, losing weight is a very positive thing to move away from diabetes, to be a, move away from aging. Yes, I thought I saw another hand. Yes. I noticed in the chart earlier, the age that men and women would, would live would be, of course, the women tend to outlive the men. But, and that was up to about age 65 or 70. But on the chart that shows that the year 2030, mm -hmm. the women would by, were much more outlived than the men, which kind of concerns me. It's getting much worse. It was already bad. <laughs> I'm sorry, Tom, I don't have an answer. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, the ladies do tend to live longer. I, I don't know uh, exactly why. We don't have all the answers for that. Uh, maybe some of the men's bad habits? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm trying to avoid them. Yes? How are, how are the boomers going to age? Exactly. Yeah. So you're eating healthy and staying active. Uh -huh. Yes, people who are active, eating well, and, uh, and are exercising well, the stamina keeps up. It's, I mean, there is a genetic component to this. You saw it's about 30%, so you have to do the best you can with what you've got. But people who have you know, reached the 65, 70 years of age, 80, who have changed their lifestyle around have had significant improvements in their capacity, uh, climbed mountains and those types of things. So, that squaring off thing. And we can pull the, the thing back up. It doesn't have to just go down. Yes? There's not a magic number that I can give you for your caloric restriction. I would just strongly encourage you to live on the lower side. Try to live on the lower side. I don't know where it is for you. For the rats, it's they feed them all they want. Okay. And if you're eating all you want, it's too much. <laughs> so there needs to be some restriction, you know. Uh, too much, what does the wise man say? Too much honey will make you sick, right? It's, but a little sweetness is good. I mean, there's, we, to eat well, but to keep ourselves a little bit on the hungry side is actually the best way to live long. It's what the science is telling us. Exactly what the restriction is for you, I don't know. Uh, they're saying something like the, the people that are doing this, if you look on the website, are looking for about a 40% reduction in their uh, calories. So uh, I suppose you could do the calculations for your uh, uh, height and sex and age and then cut the calories down. But you have to make sure you get adequate nutrients because if you come short in chromium or zinc or uh, you know, some of the antioxidants, you can get yourself in trouble. You don't want to come short in important nutrients. So you need a, a, a nutritionally dense diet, but a calorically restricted. Yes? You can cut your calories by eating fewer french fries and being hungry all the time, or you can cut your calories by eating a lot of whole foods and not being hungry all the time. The whole foods tends to make us much more comfortable. We're not hungry all the time if we eat whole foods. The food, the way God designed it, is to fill us up without giving us too many calories. The more we refine it, the more holiday we add to it, it seems, the uh, less healthy it is. So, a lot empty calories is another word. Yes, ma'am.
Cooked food? I think that's a reasonable thing to do. That's not bad. Raw, uh, raw food, food as grown. Uh, cooking releases some nutrients uh, as well, and I think to have a balance is very reasonable. So, we, uh, okay. Oh, you mean extreme caloric restriction to really get the weight off fast? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. The problem is when you take the weight off really fast, you burn half fat and half muscle. And when you burn muscle, you end up, it can be a real problem. You don't want to, to really do that. It's better to do the long, slow, gradual rather than the real rapid weight loss. It's the journey that brings the health. It's not the end. Did I say that right? That is, you don't have to get down to an ideal weight. You just need to be headed in that direction. And you gain the benefits as far as longevity is concerned. When uh, we do have concerns about uh, getting nutrient deficient in, in the late elderly, I think I, I referred to them, the science calls people late elderly. When people get very thin, they can get protein and calorie uh, malnutrition, and that can lead to their actually eating up their heart and that type of thing. So I'm, I'm really talking more to the ambulatory elderly rather than the very elderly, because that's a, a little different uh, place, different uh, uh, circumstance. Well, uh, interesting journey. Did it go where you thought it was? A lot of people are surprised to hear that uh, caloric restriction is, is, is so important. And we've kind of reviewed ways to do that that are, are healthy. And I would encourage you to make some choices that will help you live long, happy, and healthy lives. Thank you very much.